So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jody Allen. I teach history at William and Mary, and I'm the Robert Francis Ings Director of the Lemon Project, A Journey of Reconciliation. I'm so glad to see so many of you out this evening for what I think is going to be a very thought provoking um, and interesting talk by Mr. Jaye Person Lin. Um, but first, before I get to um, Mr. Person Lin's um, bio, I want to just let you know that we're having a second um, porch talk this week featuring our own um, Jawan Johnson. And he's going to be talking about uh, doing a workshop rather on genealogy, finding my people, African American genealogy, an African American genealogy workshop. Um, and if you would like to know more about Lemon Project um, programs, you can, uh, and, and you would like to be a part of the listserv, you can sign up, you can email us at lemon.wm, I'm sorry, lemon at wm.edu. Thank you. So for this evening, uh, we're here to, again, as I said, uh, we're going to be hearing from attorney Jaye Person Lin. And let me um, just share a little bit about um, him. He's a, a, an attorney and an abolitionist born into freedom to Isidra and Kwaku Person Lin. He's the fifth, uh, I'm sorry, the youngest of five children and was raised in Southern California. Um, he's a fourth generation Angelino, and he graduated from Hampton University in 2004 and Howard University Law School in um, 2007. He's an attorney, he's a, and a solo practitioner who established person, the Person Lynn Law Office in October, 2013 after spending six years in the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office as a law clerk and paralegal. His practice is mainly criminal defense, um, civil and, and personal injury law. Attorney Lynn's main passion is bringing awareness to and seeking to abolish the current penal system, which perpetuates the enslavement of black people, mainly black men who make up just 3.3% of California's population, but 27% of the state's prison population. And nationwide, um, that's 6% of the population and 30% of the prison population. Attorney Person Lynn is a victim of this system himself and is currently serving misdemeanor probation for one count of delaying or obstructing a law enforcement officer in the performance of their duty um, after being tased, tackled, and arrested inside a courthouse um, when deputies of San Bernardino County disbelieved that he was an attorney without ever seeking to verify the information. Despite the weight of his, his profession and calling as an abolitionist, attorney person Lynn finds time to enjoy life by traveling and learning, learning and doing a podcast, We Not For Sell, and that's not K-N-O-T. He also helps organize and curate several community, community events and activities in Southern California. Okay, without taking any more time away from attorney Person Lynn, I'm going to turn, over, um, turn it over to him for his remarks. Uh -huh. Thank you so much um, for Dr. Allen for, first of all, inviting me and allowing me to be here on this platform. Um, though I am a fourth generation Angelino, uh, I want to let people know that that's on my father's side. My mother's father is from Emporia, Virginia, and my mother's mother is from Windsor, Virginia. And uh, I still visit frequently and I'm very much connected to Virginia. As you mentioned, I'm a Hampton University alumnus as well. Um, <clears throat> and Sarah Thomas, it's uh, been a pleasure of getting to work with you in, in developing this. So I'm here to talk about is the true status of descendants of enslaved Africans. And the reason uh, here in the United States 
And the reason I put it that way, as opposed to just um, black people is because black people is a pan ethnic term that encompasses about three, 400 million people in India, uh, people all throughout Asia, all throughout Latin America, South America, the whole entire continent of Africa, so on and so forth, all through Europe. But I'm talking about the specific group of Black people uh, who went through a, the process of chattel slavery, and it changes you when you go through this process. And so now we're um, getting to be on the other side of that, mostly on the other side of that, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do. I want to be clear on who I'm talking about. And though you have those who classify as African American, um, Black, uh, American descendants of slaves, uh, descendants of enslaved Africans, whatever, uh, I don't think we're at a point as a people to split hairs that much. So uh, the reason why I say the descendant of enslaved Africans is because whoever fits that bill, this is who I'm talking about as people from uh, Black people from other parts of the world, even those that may have experienced, uh, their ancestors may have experienced enslavement in other parts of the Americas. Uh, we're, we're uniquely situated here in this land, being that we're in the, the land and the country that ended up being a true hegemony in society, meaning a, a sole world power no one on the level, no one with the political and military and economic power of America. And though the uh, things are shifting on a global scale, uh, it's uncontroverted that throughout the 90s and early 2000s, the US was clearly number one. Um, and when I talk about our status, I got to this point because I would spend a lot of time in high schools, middle schools, so on and so forth, talking to children about their rights. And I don't know if anyone saw the movie American Skin, but there was a scene in that movie where uh, Nate Parker's son was talking to a friend about what he was learning at his suburban high school about rights and how the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, an, an unlawful um, arrest is a battery in essence, and you have the right to defend yourself, um, even up to the point of using deadly force against even an officer that, that seeks to unlawfully arrest you or harm you. Um, and he stopped his son and said, I don't ever want you thinking that. And that's, that's the mindset that I get to when I talk about status versus rights, because it's um, disingenuous in my belief to talk to black people, descendants of enslaved Africans. Um, and I'll use it kind of interchangeably. But I just want to point out who I was talking about. Um, it, I think it's disingenuous to teach children that they have these rights uh, that America promises when in actuality, you have the, it's a different rule for you. So now before I ever talk about rights, before I ever talk about the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, and so on, um, I, I have to qualify the status. And the status of descendants of enslaved Africans was um, written into the founding document of the United States of America. That document is the Declaration of Independence. And that document uh, created by five different um, people uh, or five men are credited uh, with writing that document, the most notice, notable being Virginia's own Thomas Jefferson. Um, and when they, they wrote in that first line of second paragraph that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That sentence forever relegated those who were enslaved at the time to subhuman status in the written word and the psyche of the United States of America. How do we know this? Because in by their own words, all men are created equal. And by men, they meant mankind. 
right? And maybe, you know, that's even arguable. Maybe they only meant men in the physical sense. But still, if, if they're talking about mankind, all men are created e equal with certain unalienable rights. Amongst them, life, liberty. We know slaves, those who were enslaved, and I use that term versus slave because these are human beings that were enslaved. And I think it humanizes uh, those ancestors to, to talk about them in that form of being humans that were enslaved than just the title slave. But I may slip up and say that. But when you have that, uh, those words, you own human beings in your mind and in the words you wrote, they are not and cannot be human beings based on the definition of human, of man that you wrote in that Declaration of Independence, which is the foundation that everything else in these United States was built upon. Uh, and so we have to start there to understand the status of the descendant of the enslaved African here in America. Um, now that document, uh, which I, I'll likely be addressing later uh, when we get to the abolitionist portion of the discussion, um, I, it's otherwise a beautiful document. I used to read that document uh, from about 2012 to about 2016. Every 4th of July, I would wake up and read the Declaration of Independence as a proud American. In high school, I used to say the Pledge of Allegiance over the um, loudspeaker at my high school. And I, I said it proudly. I was proud of that uh, because there, there are certainly some things to be proud of. But when you break it down, um, the, the history, and I, I cannot now, knowing what I know and having experienced what I experienced, um, think the same way. So we start there with the Declaration of Independence that permanently relegated us to subhuman status. And then we go on to the Constitution. When we were addressed in the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, the three-fifths compromise, they talked about the people who were actually citizens. They talked about those who were foreigners, the, the indigenous peoples, and how they would be regarded. And when it came to us, we were counted as three-fifths of persons. Now, this is a unique part of our history, right? Because the, here's a, a, a time in history um, where you had the Southern slave owners actually wanting to recognize our humanity, but not for our benefit, only for their benefit, right? So our humanity has always been recognized when it can benefit those who profit off of us, but not so much for our own benefit. And the Northerners who history tells us saw us as humans and shouldn't be enslaved um, were the ones arguing that we shouldn't be uh, classified as human beings and counted at all. And so we ended up with this three-fifths compromise. That's how we would be counted for purposes of electoral colleges and uh, uh, seats in Congress and so on and so forth. So that's a very unique time in our history. Um, and I'm not here to debate whether the three-fifths clause was solely for political purposes or this or that. What we know for a historical fact is that when the enslaved people of the time were addressed in the United States of the Constitution, they were addressed as three-fifths of persons. And so the Declaration of Independence, which three-fifths of the founders of the, those credited with drafting it owned slaves at the time it was drafted, and Benjamin Franklin had previously owned slaves but had given it up in the 1850s, I believe, uh, and only John Adams was one of the drafters that never owned slaves. Um, so shout out to him. Um, but when, when you look at uh, that constitution, it's just a historical fact, it's still there today. And that is it, that's how we were um, addressed. So then we go on to the Dred Scott decision, um, the Dred Scott v. Sanford decision. And when we look up uh, Dred Scott v. Sanford, uh, that was a decision by the United States Supreme Court. So the greatest legal minds of the time, the greatest legal authority, the highest legal authority on how the Constitution should be interpreted. Um, they interpreted it 
in a way that was clear. And so when talking about it, they, they stated, when speaking of descendants of enslaved Africans, uh, that they had for more than a century, and this is a quote, they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. And so this is the record of the United States of America when it comes to the status of our people. Uh, so I wanted to be clear on that uh, and and lay it out so plainly that it cannot be questioned. This is the foundation of the United States of America. Um, and so okay. Uh, so when we get past that, um, and then we go through the Civil War, we go through Reconstruction and you know, Reconstruction, that period is what makes me believe that this country is, all hope is not lost. There, we can work together because in that time period, you had black people or descendants of slaves uh, elevated to the positions of senators and congresspersons and other elected officials and sheriffs. And having that respect, there's no way uh, a black person gets elected to a Senate seat without the support of white people. It's just impossible it, today and at any time. There's no state uh, in the union that black people are that uh, populous in that state to where whoever, if they vote in a block, they're certainly gonna win. Um, so I wanna be clear on that. But shortly after um, that short eight year period of reconstruction, we got back and, and in reconstruction, uh, the Constitution, we had the amendments, right? And there's many people that will argue that the 14th Amendment um, uh, overturned the three-fifths clause and, uh, as when it said that we are, everyone born here is a citizen. Now, that puts those of us who were here by the time the 14th Amendment was, was drafted in the 1860s, um, you know, Afri there, there are people who had been here for, for, for over 250 years at that time. But all the 14th Amendment did, it didn't give them any real stay in the nation. It just put them on the same level as anybody. It's, you know, you hear about Russians uh, doing um, birth tourism and traveling to the US and holding up in a hotel for a few months just to have a baby on this soil so their children can be regarded as uh, American citizens for whatever future plans they may have. But that's what it, it gave us. It didn't give us any more stakes. So, and, and I wanna point out that there is a difference between citizenship and humanity. So although the Dred Scott case deemed black people as not citizens and descendants of uh, the enslaved as not citizens by which the constitution did not apply. And the 14th amendment is now supposed to say um, that we are citizens and now the constitution does apply. Uh, in actuality, the, the dehumanization that came in the Declaration of Independence was still not addressed by the 14th amendment. And I, I want that to be clear. You know, there's when we talk about how people view people, there's people that like try and leave wills to dogs and stuff because they love them so much and view them as, you know, members of the family, which I have no problem with, but it just goes to uh, show that just because you, you view me as a citizen doesn't mean you fully respect my humanity. Uh, and so I want to be clear on that. And then right after that amendment came, what did we have? We had the Jim Crow era. So now there's actually laws on the books that, you know, there's, there were always laws on the books that made it uh, illegal to intermarry um, up until recently. I think the last one was officially taken off the books in like the 2000s, the early 2000s. Um, we had the vagrancy laws, the, the black codes, and so on and so forth that 
um, still legally by law, and these laws were upheld by uh, courts for uh, nearly a century um, before they, they, you know, legislation started coming down and uh, rulings started being made that did a bit more to recognize our humanity, but there's still nothing in the record that actually does. Uh, so we had those Jim Crow laws and that affected us in so many ways um, because really, uh, if you ask most people in the descendant of um, enslaved Africans community, you know, whether we care how we're viewed by uh, white America or the mainstream, most of us really don't care to that degree of your personal beliefs. But we do care now when it comes to uh, wealth acquisition, when it comes to being able to live where we want to live, when it comes to being able to have our uh, uh, individual freedoms respected. Now we care how you view, how you view us, but personally, uh, that's not really our thing because we want to have the freedom to dislike who we want to dislike. Um, but it's important that we understand this status and that it's not just something that we feel in our in our hearts or that we even see on TV. This is the written word of the United States. And then it went from the Jim Crow and we made it through uh, that to a certain degree. Um, and then it, it went forward to the mass incarceration era, where, which we're still in. And what was the bridge, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, the war on drugs. And so now we have to look at these laws, which is once again on the record of the United States and the laws that really bring law enforcement to our communities, the same agencies that still use the same tactics uh, to catch people that they did when they were, you know, slave catching and that were born uh, from uh, slave catching, the same institution is still in place. Uh, we, we see that it's the guns and the drugs, right? Like California, for instance, um, the Black Panthers were established in like late 66, early 1967. And within months, California was an open carry state. Everyone nationwide knows California has some of the strictest gun laws in the United States. But at that time, when the Black Panthers formed, the rules got changed. The Mulford Act was implemented, and now it was no longer legal to carry uh, loaded weapons in public. And so that goes further to the status, right? Because if we were truly relegated as full-fledged citizens and our humanity uh, respected, the laws wouldn't get changed. The rules wouldn't change whenever we master them and learn how to use them to our benefit. And so that's just one example. And then you go nationwide. And I know, you know, there's a lot of people that have very strong issues on gun control, but I also want people to understand that all gun control is racist and it's based on the maintenance of uh, white supremacy and black inferiority that dates back to the Declaration of Independence. How do we know this? America knows greater than anyone that you cannot enslave someone that is armed and willing to die for their freedom. How does America know this? They took on the greatest military known to man at that time and won. Why? Because they had the arms to do it. They had the power to fight. It wasn't that they had more resources at the time. It's just they had the will to be free and the desire to be free and the guns to shoot and make that freedom happen. And that is what America is uh, kind of afraid of, in my view, with these strict gun laws. And we, we know this because there's so many of these gun laws um, geared towards AR-15s and the conversation geared towards AR-15s. And if we were really cared for, you know, the conversation wouldn't be on AR-15s. Very few people die from rifles annually. The vast majority, 95% and up of people that die from gunshots die from pistols, handguns. So why we need new legislation to limit the kind of artillery that would allow a citizen, a, a militia to develop or private citizens to protect themselves against the government, it, it seems to me there's a, a bigger play that may even go beyond race, but it's certainly 
another historical fact, the first gun laws in America was that black people couldn't have them. Um, so we have that and it's the, the drugs and the guns, right? We have CVS on this corner, Walgreens on this corner, little mom and pop pharmacies over here, all selling drugs. All of them are selling drugs. But when most street drugs, you know, say for crack and uh, methamphetamines, um, but when it comes to uh, cocaine, um, marijuana, those things like that, these are substances that have been around for thousands of years, but are now illegal and law enforcement agencies use the fact that these substances are present in the black community um, uh, to maintain oppressive amounts of, of uh, uh, positions in our communities. And so that goes towards that status, right? You can, it's, it's play by these rules the, and the rules change so much that it really doesn't matter what we do which goes back to the Mulford Act and the Black Panthers. Um, so I just wanted to start there and, and let, that, let anyone listening know that is the position that I come from when, it talks to when I talk about status. So based on that, bringing it uh, full circle, uh, it's my true belief that descendants of enslaved Africans have about three fifths of the rights of the true Americans. And you know, how do I say this? The freedom of speech, right? When, when we say something, um, the penalties are much harsher than when other groups of people say something. Uh, the second amendment, we don't have that right. I have clients who in California, even though our gun laws are strict, they say, if a gun is in your vehicle, it has to be unloaded, uh, separated, you know, the ammo can be near it, but not attached to the uh, gun in any way. So you can't have like a loaded magazine in the slide of a pistol, even if it's not all the way connected where it clicks, it's still connected somewhat. You can't have, uh, you know, the, the shotgun shells uh, attached to the side of the, the shotgun that people have. Uh, that's in, that's, you know, the law. And, but I have clients who or suffer an illegal search because the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to Black people the same way. And then a gun is found and they end up being arrested, although it's in the trunk and the statute says that it needs to be either in a fully enclosed uh, locked container um, or in your trunk. And so it's in the trunk, it's, um, it's unloaded, but the, the illegal search into that trunk finds it. And now this person has a felony arrest on their record, which is 100% uh, permanent. Now with modern day technology, when you get a felony arrest, um, it's sent to the federal DOJ and federally there is no function to uh, expunge or seal or destroy an arrest record. So you never get that DNA sample back. You never get that, those fingerprints back, that mugshot back on the federal level. Although California does have statutes that uh, can get those, those records sealed and destroyed, federally there aren't. So we suffer these traumas of these arrests and you know, being put in chains certainly um, reveals generational traumas that we may not even know exist until we're actually in those chains and those locked cells and we're not free to leave. Uh, so um, I just wanted to point out those are my positions uh, on the status. And so whenever I believe uh, when you're talking to young people who are descendants of enslaved Africans, I think it's imperative to uh, point out the status before you start talking about the rights. Then you can talk about the rights, but understand like Nate Parker's character in American Skin told his son, the rules are different. And so whatever they tell you the rights are, you have the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association in the First Amendment, you have about three fifths of those freedoms. Uh, the, your, your right to be free from unlawful un, and unreasonable searches and seizures, you have about three fifths of that rights. Meaning when the violations happen to you, they have to be blatantly egregious 
for you to be able to get some redress. Uh, and you're certainly not gonna get redress in the moment. So it's better for you to just understand your status. And that doesn't mean you are less of a human being. It just means in this land, you're different. The same way when people come to my house, my friends come to my house, they can't just open the refrigerator until we get permission. It's not because I don't love them. It's not because they're not welcome in my home. It's because they're of a different status of uh, even a child that lives in that home that can freely open and close that refrigerator. And that's what we have to understand. So um, I'll conclude my remarks there and uh, would love to start the Q&A portion of, of this uh, of this discussion and thank you for those that have listened and, and you know given me that time to discuss my position. All right, Dr. Allen, you there? I think thank you um, very much, Jaye and our uh, attorney person Lynn, if you that was um, um, I guess one of my first questions is to ask you to talk about, you mentioned early on that you are right now dealing with um, the system yourself, right? Or you, that's in your bio. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, what, what that's about, what that situation um, is that you're dealing with right now? Certainly, yes. Um, in early 2019, 19, I was, uh, I live and practice in Los Angeles, California, mainly, but Southern California is a very large uh, area. And so I take cases in other counties as well, San Bernardino County, uh, in particular, where I was, this courthouse that I was going, that this case was in was about 70 miles from my home and office. So on the day I did not have court, I went out there to retrieve discovery, meet with my client, go to the scene, do all those kind of things to prepare for the case. And I also wanted to handle an administrative task with the clerk in the courtroom. And so I called beforehand to see what the uh, procedures were and was told I needed to go to the clerk's office, which I did. And once I got there, I was told that I needed to go to uh, the courtroom. Now I was not dressed in a suit, I had on a a shirt that was a dashiki print on the back, white on the front and dashiki print on the lower front part of the shirt with colors, red, green, yellows, and so forth. Um, and then some red slacks like chino pants and then some camouflage moccasin style shoes, a uh, closed toe, which was within the dress code of the court, but certainly not the typical attire of an attorney. Uh, but once again, I was not, I did not have a case on calendar uh, I was simply seeking to speak to the clerk. So I go into the courtroom, I walk up to the clerk's desk, uh, Deputy Paul Berry, who's standing a bit before the door of the lockup area of the, the courtroom, asks, does he know me? I say, no, you don't, but I'm here to speak to the clerk about one of my cases. He points to the gallery area of the courtroom for the public saying, I need to go back there. And when I asked him why, he said, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I then told him I am an attorney and restated my business. He then directed me to the bailiff's desk to check in with her. I did that. I walked uh, based on his instruction to the bailiff's desk. And while I was trying to explain to her um, who I was and pull out my bar card to show them, Deputy Barry grabbed me and pushed me and uh, out to the gallery area. Based on a belief I was not who I said I was, um, and a, a further belief that I was actually a liar uh, because if he had any kind of uh, belief in his mind that it was possible that I was actually an attorney, he would have asked for a bar card, a business card or something, but none of that happened. I just was uh, subjected to violence because they didn't believe I was who I really am. And so uh, when I went to walk around Deputy Barry, he put his hands and pushed me again. At that point, uh, he put his hand like right in the middle of my chest. So I bring my hand up uh, to show my displeasure. Um, he moves his hand down and there is a video. You can see like his reaction. He describes it like I smacked his hand away, but you can see his reaction. And I know it can be viewed as if I removed his hand, but whether I did or I didn't, the Supreme Court has ruled an unlawful touching 
is illegal and I can defend myself based on that. Uh, so ultimately, that is the act I was convicted of, uh, removing his hand from my chest the second time he pushed me, but not as a battery charge, as somehow that delaying or obstructing this man who was already in the courtroom um, and said he was pushing me as part of his job. Uh, so that goes on to show the whole piece about the rules being different for us. Um, I walk around as a descendant of enslaved African as a criminal just by waking up. Because if I was not a criminal in the minds of those jurors that convicted me just by waking up, and even my status of attorney did not alleviate me of that uh, view of being less than and criminal, um, I would not have ever got convicted. I would have not have been prosecuted. I would not have been pushed. I would not have been tased. After that, we had a back and forth. They uh, instructed me to go out to the vestibule area. And once we got out to the vestibule area, I certainly um, had some choice words for Deputy Barry telling him he effed up when he put his hands on me. And I promised him I was gonna come after him with everything I have and everything I learned in law school. And he shot me with a taser, uh, tackled me and arrested me. And um, you know, we went to fight, filed every motion you could file. Um, and even though there's case law in California that says, um, you don't, you, there's no duty to respond with alacrity, meaning cheerful and immediate to police orders. And you have a right to uh, verbally respond. I mean, to verbally challenge officers that may give an order. Um, I was still arrested and prosecuted under the statute that that case law says my actions did not make a crime. Uh, so ultimately um, we went to trial uh, after we had a hearing to dismiss it, a judge ruled that I was not seized until I was tased. Uh, but, and if that's true, then it's legally inconsistent that I could be convicted of removing his hand from my chest when I was not seized. Me not being seized means he had no right to touch me. Uh, so, you know, we're confident that when a judge that really cares about the law actually looks at this on appeal, which the, this is the process we're going through now, that we'll be successful on that appeal. And we're still um, uh, pursuing a civil claim as I, although the judge allowed the prosecutor to enumerate nine different acts in this two and a half minutes that I could have done to violate this law, I was simply convicted of one three second act. And you know that's just another example of how the rules change. And I'm currently uh, on misdemeanor probation with my only terms being to obey all laws. So what does um, being, I guess, how does that um, being on misdemeanor probation, does that impact your professional? Well, the judge, oddly enough, uh, one good ruling she did make was that it was not a um, crime of moral turpitude. Uh, meaning a crime that would go against like the morales and the, the elevated ethical standards that attorneys are supposed to live by. Um, so with that, um, she felt that it did not require her to uh, report the conviction to the bar. Um, and I don't have a duty to report it until the appeal, only if the appeal should be uh, denied. And so, um, you know, if that happens, then, you know, I'll report it. And the bar who gave me the license to be in the part of the courtroom I was in, um, I, I, they should not uh, penalize me in any way for being in the part of the courtroom that the license that I earned from, they didn't give it to me. I want to be clear. I earned that license going through the background check, passing the exam, going to law school. I earned that license there. So I, I don't see how the people that gave me that li or that authorized uh, the license um, for me to be there would penalize me for being there and being disbelieved when I clearly stated who I was and what I was there for. But at this moment, it's, you know, I'm still able to practice and move in and out of jails and courtrooms and things like that. Okay. Great. Well, uh, we have some questions from participants, so I'm going to um, hold mine for a little bit. And um, the, the first one 
um, is what are some things um, you recommend that we tell teenagers to do when dealing with police officers, especially at traffic stops? Um, first, understand your status. Understand you are less than in this land. So presenting yourself, which is what I thought in that moment in that courtroom, right? That I had a license to be here. I'm a real attorney. I, you know, I should be protected. Uh, understand the law does not protect you outright. There are some protections. Um, so understanding that your goal is not to, should not be to um, prove your, your prowess or let pride take over in that circumstance because we're behind enemy lines and the goal is to survive. And, and even though, uh, and not just not suffer the indignity of going to jail and you know being having handcuffs put on you. So it, I would suggest that they be res respectful, uh, but respectfully decline to engage in any discussion. Um, if you are driving, you want to have your license, registration, and proof of insurance available to you immediately. You know, you can go ahead and maybe get a copy of each and either uh, have it in the side panel door or somewhere that you don't have to uncover it to reach it and turn that over immediately. Let them know respectfully, officer. Um, I was instructed by my attorney, whether you have one or not, just I was instructed by my attorney uh, not to speak with law enforcement, but I'm consenting to sign any ticket you have and just end it at that. Um, that's the safest way. And just keep repeating that if they try to engage you in conversation any further. But uh, it's no need to get loud uh, or combative, um, being that you're going to lose that battle there on the street. And so I, it's very humbling. It is uh, an indignity that you have to suffer and that you will continue to suffer as long as you decide to stay here. Um, but once again, it's about survival till we can get to that point to where this we are fully respected and uh, acknowledged and honored in this society or leave. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... And sign the ticket because that's them saying they're not gonna arrest you. If you don't sign the ticket, they can legally arrest you. Good information. Um, now, this question kind of go, goes back a little bit to your um, appeal. Do you know um, when you can expect to hear about the, about the appeal? Um, I'd expect probably around May, um, May, June timeframe, I don't know, but the misdemeanor appeals are done at the superior court level. So they're not done, they don't have to go to the court of appeals yet. There's another level that you can go to the court of appeal, but misdemeanor appeals are done at the superior court level. Uh, so it should be a bit quicker. And, uh, you know, we'll get our, our briefings um, scheduled and, you know, we'll submit ours, they'll submit theirs. And, uh, you know, the decision I, I would expect around maybe May, May or June. Okay. So I don't think I'll be able to go to Canada until then. Okay. Okay. Um, this, this next question, one wonders how often people come into the court pretending to be a lawyer, exclamation mark. Uh, I would suspect not often. So, so why such a strong reaction, do you think? Well, one thing, um, most deputies would not respond this way, even the ones that are racist or whatnot. Most of them have some bit of uh, professional decorum about them that this deputy just did not have. But the, the thing we have to understand, he talked about, he testified that he's been a deputy sheriff for 25 years, and he spent like 10 years in custody assignments and 15 years in the courtroom. So imagine that somebody that was a deputy sheriff for 25 years that has never been out to patrol. There's a reason that that department did not unleash this person on the general public because he's probably done this numerous times before. 
And uh, we have here in California a pitches motion, which is a motion to get the, um, the uh, background, the personnel file of that officer and, and see if there's any complaints that have been lodged against him uh, to um, see if there's a pattern, you know, whether uh, it's about using excessive force, falsifying a police report, falsifying evidence. Uh, if there's been any kind of arguments, we, we have that. And typically when there's nothing, uh, the, the pitcher's motion, once you, uh, once it's granted, the judge goes in camera with the custodian of records from that department, reviews the file. And if there's nothing, they're out in, you know, five minutes or less saying, hey, there's nothing in the, in the file to report and we're moving forward. The judge, it was a, a black woman out in San Bernardino. She took, uh, went for the in-camera hearing and it lasted for about an hour. And I was thinking like, man, how much is in this person's record that it's taking them an hour to get through everything? And then she came out and said, there's nothing to disclose. And so that's just, you know, part of the way, you know, that's an example. My situation is an example of how the entire system works. When we talk about systemic and systematic oppression, uh, it's how the entire system works. The police that day, Deputy Barry should have been uh, uh, penalized and sent home on administrative leave until he was ultimately fired for using his taser uh, in a non-department approved, approved fashion. Um, but, and then charged with the crime of assault with a deadly weapon. Um, but that didn't happen. He was protected by his department. When we filed the claim against the government, uh, uh, the, the government claim form uh, the, with the Board of Supervisors of the County of San Bernardino, they denied it justifying his action. When the district attorney of that county filed the case against me, they did not protect me but justified the officer's actions. And so you have all these different levels and branches of government, the executive uh, and the police and the district attorney, and the um, there's no real like, it, it would be the legislative to a certain degree, but they're also executive, the uh, county board of supervisors, um, the DAs, all of those different branches, as well as the courts. When the judge saw this case, the judge should have said this, this is nothing about this is illegal uh, based on Mr. Person Lynn's actions, case is dismissed. But not only did the judge not do that, the judge allowed the jury to decide on things that just clearly are not crimes and certainly not the crime of delaying an officer uh, by removing his hand from my chest. When you can see on the video after that, he goes, steps back and leans on the podium. So how that delayed him, you know, when he walked off, took the taser, out his uh, holster and put it behind his back, secreting it, how that delayed him, it makes absolutely no sense. But that's a judicial branch, executive, and you know, municipal levels of government don't really have a, um, a legislative branch, but the Board of Supervisors kind of counts as both of those. So those are all the branches of the government in San Bernardino County working together to support this illegal act by this officer. And but as far as um, the he, he testified that people come in there and say that, but uh, I don't I don't know how often that happens. I don't really see that. I think what he believed was I was someone representing myself who was claiming to be an attorney uh, as opposed to me just outright lying and saying I'm an attorney. Thank you. Let's see, this um, next question, um, this person thanks you for your perspective. Um, so you mentioned the Fourth Amendment rights not being equally applied. Another ubiquitous occurrence we see after a person is charged, or found, charged, found guilty is sentencing. Can you speak to the disparity in sentencing and appeal based on race? And if you think we will ever get to a point where these injustices will approach zero. What has, what has to be done by us as a society to achieve the all people created equal assertion? Uh, certainly, and yes, it's, I don't have the uh, statistics right off the bat, but 
for the, when you look at the statistics for the same act, black people are more likely to be arrested than whites or Latinos or Asians for the same actions. And this even goes down to elementary and grade school where black children are suspended more so than any other group uh, per capita. Then once the per people are arrested, it's more likely that a black person will be prosecuted than any other group for the same act. Then when it comes to the prosecution, it's more likely that a jury or a judge would convict a black person for the same act. And then when it comes to sentencing, there are those disparities. And the reason is, it's one thing to look at someone as a upstanding person that made a mistake. But that's what the black inferiority written into the Declaration of Independence does to the psyche of the American systems and everything built on it is that we are already less than we are already. And that's why the Supreme Court ruled that. <laughs> I'm not, these aren't my words. Their words said that we were regarded as so inferior that we could justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for our own benefit. And so when you look at somebody like that, it's like, they're never gonna learn. They're savages. That's why the sentencing disparities come because we're looked at as less than uh, overall. Um, and so what will it take? Uh, and to get to that point, that's a good question because it gets me to the point about abolition. And when I say abolition, this is a novel idea that I came up with. When you read further in the Declaration of Independence, it talks about when the government ceases to meet the needs of the people, that the people have the duty and the right to abolish that government and then implement a government that does meet the needs of the people. And that's what I believe it will take to um, rid our society of these racial inequalities and inequities. And what does that look like? New convention, new constitution, new declaration of independence, declaring this nation free from white supremacy and black inferiority, a new national anthem, a new flag, new political parties being developed, new districts being drawn. Uh, all of these things is what it takes. Now, you saw the country's response to Colin Kaepernick's kneeling at the flag, so it certainly seems highly unlikely but if we are to do what has never been done in the history of man, which is have the descendants of the enslaved living harmoniously and on an equal playing field with the descendants of the enslavers, these are the things we have to do. And though we don't have an example uh, to the level of slavery, we do have the example of South Africa that gave up apartheid. And when they gave it up, what did they do? New constitution new flag, new national anthem, new political parties in play. So it's very hard for me to say that there's progress when the same system, when Harriet Tubman was, was running up and down the, the Underground Railroad and conducting on the Underground Railroad, the same flag that America flew then is the same flag they fly now, the same national anthem, the same constitution and the Democrat Democrats and Republicans were in play at that time. So with all those symbols of this nation being the same, we probably even have to change the, the national bird because it's the reason that they have a bird with a, a white head at the, at the, as the national bird. And you know, even changing the White House and making it a multicolored structure. But all of those things uh, are, are what I think it would need to take. And then over time, people can start to change, but it's in the subconscious of America when they read all men are created equal, knowing that these people were enslaved, you can't get over that with, with those words not being abolished. And so we have to, when, when you're changing something, when you're getting that cancer out, you have to dig it all the way out. You can't just gloss over it. You have to dig it all the way out. And the, the, the uh, Declaration of Independence is the, the cancer uh, as it comes, as it relates to descendants of enslaved Africans that needs to be uprooted and, and taken out. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, Dr. Kelly. 
Is if do you discuss this type of information in your podcast? Um, we not for sale. Oh, for certainly, sale. certainly. We not for sale is the unapologetic um, perspective of thirty something uh, formally educated uh, black men from Southern California. It's we don't uh, express or promote ourselves as experts in anything besides what we have expertise in, but we do have opinions and the purpose of it, the we the reason why we have the KNOT is, uh, you know, it's clearly we not for sale. That's our position. Uh, you can't buy us. We're free thinkers, we're free people and we're not for sale. But also that not is, is that not, that tightness of the group of friends uh, and why we uh, put sale C-E-L-L -L, as opposed to S-A-L-E or S-E-L-L -L, is because we're not for your cages. We're not for your, um, for, for your sales on one instance, but the other instance is that we are a not a group that's tight together for the sale being the, the uh, atom or the tiny particle that makes up all of our bodies uh, and that we are for our community and our people and that uh, those of us who check us out can definitely depend on us to present a uh, well-reasoned position, whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, we're just regular people presenting ourselves, but we do it so others like us can feel confident in speaking their truth. Thanks. Now we only have about two minutes left, so and you can certainly go over one or two. But I want to give you a chance to talk to, to share with us um, your ideas for so solutions because we appreciate uh, certainly your point of view and your sharing that. Um, but what what should we know in terms of, or what should we be thinking about in terms of solutions um, to the to the issues you've talked about? Well, solutions in our individual lives and in our personal lives. Um, if, if I'm speaking just to descendants of enslaved Africans, my top two is economic empowerment uh, and um, protecting ourselves, being putting ourselves in a position to protect ourselves mentally, physically, spiritually, my, uh, financially, so on and so forth. Um, also, we have to leave the United States. Um, and when I say that, I'm not talking about physically, but we cannot think about what it does to our ancestors when we proudly fly the flag that they were enslaved under. Think about what it does to our ancestors when we sing that national anthem that uh, when, you, when you go deeper into the verses, it talks about those of us who fought on the other side uh, in hopes of being free that even we beat y'all too, so stay in your place. Think about that. And uh, what that means is going out your way. The Montgomery bus boycott lasted for over a year. That means they walked through a, a Southern winter, summer, spring and fall. And so it's gonna be uncomfortable. When the people left the plantation initially, it was uncomfortable. They were freed into famine and, and poverty, but it has to start somewhere. So for those of us, and not just us, anybody that looks at us as true citizens and true people who have value, you should not expect us to fly the flag of our oppressors. There's a reason staunch patriot Americans don't fly the English flag, even though that's who started the nation, because they uprooted those chains that the, their oppressors had on them. And so it is the most American thing for us to do, to do the same thing. And so that does not mean completely change the way of life, but it means we have to change that mindset and, and by identifying ourselves as a separate nation within this land. And that doesn't mean disobey the laws of the land because when I go to China, I'm driving whatever speed limit they tell me to, to drive in China. It just means that psychologically, have to start changing ourselves because we cannot get young black men and women to believe in a system that oppresses them. And so giving them something to believe in is a new nation, a nation for the descendants of enslaved Africans. 
Um, and whatever that turns out being, if it comes, if, if it ends up that our story is the same as the Israelites in the Bible, who, when you look at their story, it's like Egypt at the time was what America is today. And they got quote unquote free in society, but Pharaoh kept messing with them. God sent the plagues down. Pharaoh kept messing with them. And the only thing that got them free from Pharaoh's oppression was completely physically leaving that area. So I don't know if that's what it will take, but it certainly takes those of us who are us and those of us who support us to uh, cease to engage in, in this society and work. I believe 2026 will be a great year. That's you know 250 years um, since the, the Declaration of Independence. It was a good run, but let's start over. And it doesn't mean we have to change the quality of life, but when we start over and rewrite the, the founding documents and build a nation based on true equity and equality of human beings and respect for my humanism, which does not mean you have to like me. It does not mean you have to listen to the music I listen to, eat what I eat, wear what I wear. It just means you have to respect that I'm a human who has the right to like the music and like the food and like the culture that I like. Uh, once we do that, I think we'll get somewhere. And that means, you know, it might mean so far as, you know, descendants of enslaved Africans not participating in the Olympics and showing the world how successful America would be without our help. So that's the, the kind of things that, you know, the kind of radical ideas we'll, we'll have to take. And I think anybody that truly cares for us would understand why we cannot fly this flag. And, and the way we know, especially our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, it would be disrespectful to even insinuate them flying the, the Hitler flag. But in reality, that's what it is for us because our Holocaust is still ongoing. Thank you so much, Attorney Person Lynn, for giving us such, um, such an interesting um, such interesting perspectives and, and a way of thinking about what's happening in the country that is outside of the box, right? Um, and, but that's maybe where we have to go, as you're saying, um, to make meaningful changes, not so much to have two separate countries, but a way to make this one country um, meet all the needs, you know? Um, and so it's a very, uh, very interesting again perspective and I appreciate your coming. Well, I still speak like we're in person, but I appreciate your sharing with us via Zoom. Uh, we, we are out of time uh, for questions, but thank you again for participating and thank you all for coming. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday night for um, Dr. Johnson's presentation on genealogy. So have a great rest of your evening. Um, Thank you so much. It was truly a pleasure, truly a pleasure. Thank you.